Israel strikes Gaza school turns shelter. United Nations Security Council renews sanctions against Sudan. Good afternoon and Salam Malaysia Madani. This is World Today and my name is Daryl Baptist. An Israeli airstrike hit a central Gaza school with the Civil Defense Agency reporting at least 18 people killed and many others injured in the facility-turned-displacement shelter. The UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees said six of its staff were killed in the attack. The Al Jauni school in New Surat, already hit several times during the war, was struck again yesterday, wounding numerous people. The fatalities included several women and children. About 5,000 displaced people were sheltering at the school when it was hit yesterday. The school used to be run by the United Nations Agency for Palestinian Refugees, UNRWA. Al Jauni school has been hit at least five times in more than 11 months of war. In July, at least 16 people were killed in an Israeli airstrike on the facility. The vast majority of the Gaza Strip's 2.4 million people have been displaced at least once by the war, with many seeking safety in school buildings. Israeli forces have struck several such schools in recent months, saying Hamas fighters were operating there and hiding among displaced civilians. Charges denied by Hamas group. On a related note, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said a lack of accountability for the killing of United Nations staff and humanitarian aid workers in the Gaza Strip is totally unacceptable. Describing Israel's offensive against Hamas in Gaza, Guterres said there have been very dramatic violations of the international humanitarian law and the total absence of an effective protection of civilians. Fortunately, the institutions we have uh, um, have shown an enormous difficulty in uh, making sure that the accountability takes place. We have courts, uh, but we see that the decisions of courts are not respected. And uh, um, uh, it is this kind of limbo of accountability that is totally unacceptable. Nearly 300 humanitarian aid workers have been killed during the conflict. Meanwhile, a Hamas delegation met Qatari and Egyptian mediators in Doha to discuss a truce in Gaza and a potential hostage and prisoner exchange. Hamas said its lead negotiator, Khalil al Haya met with Qatar's Prime Minister, Sheikh Mohammed Abdul Rahman Al Thani, and Egypt's intelligence chief, Abbas Kamel. Hamas said they discussed developments concerning the Palestinian cause and the aggression on the Gaza Strip without indicating that talks had resulted in a breakthrough. Recent rounds of mediation held in Doha and Cairo have been based on a framework laid out in May by U.S. President Joe Biden and a bridging proposal presented to the parties in August. Hamas reiterated its readiness for the immediate implementation of the ceasefire agreement based on President Biden's declaration. It also restated its demand for Israel's withdrawal from all Gaza territories and had not placed any further demands on negotiators. Months of behind-the-scenes negotiations mediated by Qatar, Egypt and the United States have failed to secure a halt to the fighting between Israel and Hamas, with the exception of a one-week truce beginning in late November. North Korea has fired multiple short-range ballistic missiles into waters east of the Korean peninsula. Days after the nuclear-armed North marked a state anniversary. South Korea's Joint Chief of Staff said it had detected multiple short-range ballistic missiles launched into the East Sea around 7.10 a.m. local time from Pyongyang. 
It said it was analyzing details of the launch and closely sharing information on the North Korean ballistic missiles with the U.S. and Japanese authorities, while strengthening surveillance and vigilance in preparation for further launches. Japan's defense ministry also confirmed the launch of at least one suspected North Korean ballistic missile with the Coast Guard warning vessels to be careful. It is Pyongyang's first apparent weapons test since 1st July and comes days after the isolated, nuclear-armed country marked a key anniversary celebrating the founding of the ruling regime. Defense Minister Dato Sri Muhammad Khalid Nordin held a bilateral meeting with the United Arab Emirates, or UAE, Minister of State for Defense Affairs, Mohammad Mubarak Fadli al-Mazrawi, in Seoul, South Korea. The bilateral meeting was held on the sidelines of the Seoul Defense Dialogue. Dato Sri Muhammad Khalid said the purpose of the bilateral meeting was to strengthen existing defence relations between Kuala Lumpur and Abu Dhabi. Among the matters that they discussed were ways to enhance military-to-military -military relations between Malaysia and the UAE. This is Dato Sri Muhammad Khalid's first visit to South Korea since his appointment as Defence Minister on 12 December last year. Earlier, he attended the opening ceremony of Seoul Defence Dialogue, which has grown into an international platform for integration and unity, exploring a wide range of global issues in depth. It sees the participation of 900 delegates from 64 countries, including ministerial-level representatives from eight nations. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has unveiled more than $700 million in new economic and humanitarian aid to support Ukraine in its fight against Russia. The State Department said the assistance will support Ukraine's energy infrastructure, provide vital humanitarian assistance for internally displaced persons, and support demining operations that are preventing civilian casualties, restoring civilian infrastructure, and facilitating the safe delivery of humanitarian aid. The package includes $325 million in energy sector assistance for Ukraine to repair Ukraine's power grid, which has been damaged by Russian attacks. Nearly $290 million will provide humanitarian support, including shelter, food and winter supplies for displaced Ukrainians and refugees. An additional $102 million will be used for demining efforts, helping to clear landmines and unexploded ordnance left by Russian forces. The International Monetary Fund, also known as IMF, has reached an agreement with Ukraine on an aid program review that could open the door to $1.1 billion for the war-battered country. A staff-level agreement on the fifth review of the four-year extended fund facility agreement, subject to approval by the IMF Executive Board, would clear the way for Ukraine to access the money. It would raise to $8.7 billion the amount of funds dispersed so far to Ukraine as part of an IMF program tallying about $15.6 billion. IMF team leader Gavin Gray said Russia's war in Ukraine continues to have a devastating impact on the country and its people. Gray noted that an economic slowdown is expected in Ukraine due to repeated attacks on its energy infrastructure and the effect of the war on labor markets and overall confidence. But growth should be about 3% for this year. Inflation is expected to rise to about 9% by the end of 2024, with risks to the financial outlook considered high. Ukraine's economy has been decimated by Russia's invasion and the government is reliant on international aid to help it fund both its military and day-to-day -day governing spending. The United Nations Security Council has voted unanimously on a draft resolution renewing the Sudan sanctions regime for 12 more months. It includes an extension of an arms embargo on Sudan's Darfur region for another year, after experts said it had been regularly violated amid the ongoing civil war. 
The Council extended until 12th September next year the sanctions regime in place since 2005, which is aimed solely at Darfur. This includes individual sanctions, asset freezes and a travel ban on three people, as well as an arms embargo. Doing the sanctions measures will restrict the movement of arms into Darfur and sanction individuals and entities contributing to or complicit in destabilizing activities in Sudan. All of this is critical to helping end the escalating conflict, alleviate the humanitarian catastrophe, and put Sudan back on the path to stability and security. In their annual report published in January, experts charged by the Council with monitoring the sanctions regime said the arms embargo had been violated multiple times. They pointed the finger at several countries which had been accused of sending arms to the Rapid Support Forces. More than 16 months of war between rival Sudanese generals has killed tens of thousands of people and triggered what the United Nations calls the world's worst internal displacement crisis. Still ahead, Mexico adopts world's first judicial reform. Lawmakers in New Mexico have approved a controversial reform that will make it the first country to allow voters to elect all judges. This is hours after protesters invaded the Senate to disrupt the debate. The judicial reform was approved by 86 votes to 41 in the Senate, garnering the two-thirds majority needed to amend the Constitution in an upper chamber dominated by the ruling coalition. Earlier, legislators were forced to suspend their debate and move to another location after demonstrators stormed the upper house and entered the chamber. The plan must now be approved by 17 of the 32 state congresses, which is considered a formality given the ruling coalition's political dominance before being signed into law by the president. Around 1,600 judges would have to stand for election in 2025 or 2027. Outgoing President Andres Manuel López Obrador had pushed hard for the constitutional changes, criticizing the current judicial system as rotten, corrupt and serving the interests of the political and economic elite. The leftist leader said the reform, which has sparked street protests, would be an example to the world. He said Mexico will make great progress when it is the citizens who freely elect the judges, the magistrates and the justices. In a related development, demonstrators, including court employees and law students, were back on the streets hours after the reform was approved by the Senate. They said they are not going to surrender and give up in opposing the implementation of the judicial reform. In an unusual public warning, Supreme Court Chief Justice Norma Pina said the elected judges would become susceptible to pressure from criminal groups. In a country where powerful drug cartels regularly use bribery and intimidation to influence officials, the United States, Mexico's main trading partner, had warned that the reform would threaten a relationship that relies on investor confidence in the Mexican legal framework. Human Rights Watch, meanwhile, said the reform would seriously undermine judicial independence and contravene international human rights standards. Argentina's Congress upheld President Javier Millet's veto of a bill to increase pensions, which sparked clashes outside parliament. Thousands gathered to protest Millet's veto, with police firing pepper spray and rubber bullets at one group, including pensioners, who angrily broke down a barrier after the vote. Several pensioners were among those who clashed with police or were detained. Mille last week blocked an 8.1% pension increase, initially approved by both houses of Congress, which aimed to help cushion retirees in the South American country, 
hit by annual inflation of almost 240 percent. The president claimed the measure was manifestly in violation of the current legal framework as it does not consider the fiscal impact of the measure nor determine the source of its financing. Overturning the veto would have required the votes of two-thirds of the members of both houses of parliament. After a bitter debate that lasted more than four hours, Miele prevailed with 153 members voting against the veto, 87 in favour and eight abstentions. The minimum pension in Argentina is equivalent to 230 US dollars per month. Former Peruvian President Alberto Fujimori died yesterday at the age of 86 in the capital, Lima. His daughter Kiko Fujimori confirmed the matter on social media platform X. Fujimori, the son of Japanese immigrants, was the little-known chancellor of a farming university when elected to office in 1990. He quickly established himself as a politician whose hands-on style produced results, even as he angered critics for concentrating power. He slayed the hyperinflation that had thrown millions of Peruvians out of work, privatized dozens of state-run companies and slashed trade tariffs. In 2000, facing mounting allegations of widespread corruption, crimes against humanity and human rights abuses in his government, Fujimori fled to Japan after 10 years in power. In an attempt to return to Peru in 2005, he was detained and later convicted in 2009 and sentenced to 25 years in prison. He was released from prison on humanitarian grounds in December last year. Floods and landslides triggered by heavy rains from Typhoon Yagi have claimed at least four lives in northern Thailand and inundated thousands of homes. The government has mobilized the army to help the affected families. Prime Minister Beitong Tan Shinawatra said aid was on the way to around 9,000 families hit by the floods in the northern provinces of Chiang Mai and Chiang Rai. Confirming the first Yagi-linked deaths in the kingdom, the Disaster Prevention and Mitigation Department said two people were killed in a landslide in Chiang Mai province and two more in Chiang Rai, which borders Myanmar. The health ministry said they had deployed medical staff, volunteers and rescue workers to migrate elder people to safer places. The Thai Meteorological Department also warned that more heavy rains were expected until next Tuesday bringing the risk of fresh flash floods. While Thailand experiences annual monsoon rains, man-made climate change is causing more intense weather patterns that can make destructive floods more likely. Meanwhile, flash floods in the wake of Typhoon Yagi have also brought destruction to northern Laos, inundating villages and farmland, putting hydropower dams under strain and claiming at least one life. The rugged, mountainous provinces of Luang Nam Tha and Pong Sali are worst hit, with residents sheltering on upper floors and wading through murky brown waters. Luang Nam Tha Deputy District Chief Sivilai Pang Kiao said his team had evacuated more than 300 people from 17 villages. Aerial images of the provincial capital Luang Nam Tha showed most of the town of 50,000 residents swamped by opaque brown floodwaters. The floods also disrupted operations at some of the Chinese-run hydroelectric facilities in the area. The Pong Sali province, houses, roads, markets and schools were inundated and crops suffered extensive damage. It is difficult to get a clear picture of the situation in Laos, where the government tightly controls every information it releases. State media outlets have largely emphasized official relief efforts. But the UN's World Food Programme said it was very concerned for the safety of communities in northern Laos. Elsewhere, at least 324 people are reported dead or missing due to the landslide and flash floods triggered by Typhoon Yagi in Vietnam. Lao Chai province was one of the most affected, with 72 deaths and 111 still missing. 
The severe landslide that wiped away the entire Langnu village in the province's Baoyan district resulted in 30 deaths, 83 missing people and 18 injuries. More than 54,000 houses across the northern cities and provinces were also submerged as the water level in the region's rivers rose to alarming levels. Earlier, Ministry of National Defence deployed military helicopters to deliver disaster relief to people in affected areas in Yenbai and Chaobang provinces. Rising water levels have also compelled the capital city of Hanoi to evacuate households in areas near the Red River, including 380 in Hoan Kiem district, 836 in Baktu Liem district and 276 in Ba Din district. A total of 126 schools in the city were forced to close due to the ongoing heavy downpours. Over in the United States, three Southern California wildfires torched dozens of mountain homes, tore through a ski resort and forced thousands to evacuate in towns and cities east of Los Angeles. Around 40 homes and cabins burned in the villages of Mount Baldy and Wrightwood, and flames damaged lifts at the nearby Mountain High Ski Resort. The San Bernardino County blaze, named the Bridge Fire, exploded to over 48,000 acres in 48 hours, becoming the largest in the state. People taped gaps around their doors and schools closed in at least 10 districts because of smoky air from another blaze in San Bernardino County, namely the Line Fire. The county sheriff's office arrested a 34-year-old man for allegedly starting the blaze on 5th September. Around 18,000 people have been ordered to evacuate homes in San Bernardino County neighborhoods. Meanwhile, the airport fire in Orange and Riverside counties destroyed dozens of homes in El Cariso village and Decker Canyon as it grew to over 22,000 acres. Governor Gavin Newsom declared a state of emergency and said he had secured federal funds to fight the fires. By yesterday afternoon, the three fires had blackened over 105,000 acres of scrub, brush and forest, an area a third the size of Los Angeles. Meanwhile, firefighters, police and the armed forces were mobilized to Bolivia's soy-producing Santa Cruz region to combat relentless wildfires that have ravaged farmland for weeks. Bolivia is bracing for a potentially record-breaking year of wildfires driven by drought and land clearances tied to expanding cattle and grain production. Although the fires have been burning for weeks, smoke in cities like Santa Cruz and Cochabamba has worsened recently, causing some of the highest air pollution levels globally. The fires have forced school closures and disrupted commercial flights. President Luis Archie has called for international aid, vowing that the government will not stop until the blazes are extinguished. Next up in sports, Speedy Tigers mauled by India, an Asian Champions Trophy tournament. Starting off our sports segment this afternoon, Malaysia's task to qualify for the semi-finals of the 2024 Asian Champions Trophy Hockey Tournament has become more daunting after suffering a humiliating 8-1 hammering from India in Halanbue, China. Having drawn 2-all with Pakistan on Monday and lost 4-2 to China on Tuesday, the Speedy Tigers are rooted to the bottom of the six team standings with one point and must beat Japan and South Korea in the round-robin format if they are to realize their semi-final target. Raj Kumar Pal was in inspirational form as he notched a hat-trick with field goals in the 3rd, 25th and 33rd minutes, while R.I.G. Singh helped himself to a brace of field goals in the 6th and 39th minutes as Jugraj Singh, Harman Preet Singh and Udham Singh chipped in with one apiece. Muhammad Akimullah Anwar Isok scored a consolation goal for Malaysia in the 34th minute. Speedy Tigers head coach Sajid Singh said India were much better in every aspect and admitted the Speedy Tigers' performance was disappointing.
India, coached by Craig Fulton, topped the standings with nine points from three matches, followed by Pakistan, China, South Korea, Japan and Malaysia. In football news, South Korean soccer player Son Jun-ho has denied allegations that he had taken part in match-fixing and bribery when he played in China and said he had given a false confession as he was under duress. The Chinese Football Association banned 38 players, including Son, and five officials for life after a two-year investigation into match-fixing and gambling as part of a crackdown on corruption. The midfielder who has lost his spot in the South Korean side since the scandal broke was released and returned home in March this year after nearly 10 months in detention in China. He had agreed not to talk about his experience during detention as a condition for his release, but decided to speak up because he was shocked to find his name in China's announcement of the ban. Son, who has now signed up with Korean Football Association club Suwon, said he hoped to continue his career. On to transfer news, Dutch striker Memphis Depay arrived in Brazil and was greeted by Corinthians fans after he signed a two-year contract with the club. Terms of the deal were not announced, but local media reported the contract would be worth 12.54 million US dollars. Depay, who started for the Netherlands as they lost to England in the Euro 2024 semi-finals, has scored 46 goals and provided 32 assists in 98 appearances for his country. The attacker came through at PSV Eidenhoven and had spells at Manchester United, Lyon and Barcelona before joining Atletico at the beginning of 2023. He scored 13 goals in 40 games, but his time in Madrid was marred by injuries. Corinthians of Sao Paulo, known as the Timao, are one of the best supported teams in the country, but are in the relegation places in the Brazilian Serie A, lying 17th after 25 league games, although they have qualified for the quarterfinals of the Copa do Brasil and Copa Sudamericana. In tennis, Spain beat the Czech Republic 3-love as they began their Davis Cup Finals group stage campaign with victory. Carlos Alcaraz returned to action after his shock US Open loss to help Spain get off to a winning start. With time on his hands, he made an impromptu trip to Monza to watch the Formula One Italian Grand Prix, then was back on court in Valencia as Spain opened their group stage finals campaign against the Czech Republic. Roberto Bautista Agut bagged Spain's first point with a 7-6, 6-4 win over Giri Lahecha. Alcaraz then entered the fray, recovering from a 6-7 first set loss to Thomas Machak to wipe the floor in the second set 6-1 before Machak retired. Alcaraz followed that up by partnering with Marcel Granoles to a tense 6-7, 6-3, 7-6 doubles win over Jakub Mensik and Adam Pavlasek to claim the Group B tie 3-love. And that wraps up World Today. In our top story, Israel strikes Gaza school turned shelter. Tune in to Malaysia tonight, coming up at 8.30 p.m. on TV1 and Salran Barita RTM. Till then, I'm Dara Baptist, Malaysia Madani, Jiwa Madeka. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.